Thank you so much for being here. We, uh, we are super excited about this year. This year, our theme, our, our big picture for this year is Remnant Rising, and it's a picture of God raising up his people for such a time as this. When you look around the world and see what's going on, I would say it is definitely time for the remnant, the body of Christ, to rise up and be that church. And this series of messages, as you think about radical, and we start looking at some of the acts that the early church did as it was being exploded by the Holy Spirit of God and the word, that's what we're wanting to see. We're wanting to go back and see what was the original model for the church and maybe what was their disconnect, if you will, 
from where the church is today. I'm specifically speaking about the Western culture church. Because you can go to different parts of the world where there's great oppression and persecution, and you see the church being the church modeled back in the book of Acts and the New Testament. So as we're going through this radical series, yeah, we're hitting some of the highlights from Acts and other scriptures, but what we're wanting to do is get back to a biblical picture of what the church is supposed to be. And so when we started this series off some weeks ago, we talked about radical abandonment. And if you'll recall, it was a picture of the disciples when Jesus called them, and they they came to a point where they burned the ships, in in Peter's case, literally almost, and others to where they, they realized that the radical abandonment for Jesus was not just laying some things aside, but laying their very lives aside because they realized a biblical principle for Christians, those that follow Christ, that we find our life when we lose our life in Christ. In fact, for many people that say they're a Christian, but they don't seem to ever experience the blessings of being a Christian, oftentimes this is the first misstep or the mistake that people don't get because they think that they can come into that relationship with Christ and not really change or be recklessly or radically abandoned to him. The next week we talked about radical grace and that word grace, an acronym, if you will, for God's riches at Christ's expense. And we saw it as the delivery agent, the conduit where God's love, his forgiveness, his mercy, all those other divine attributes and characteristics that God wants to send our way. It is his grace that brings it into our lives. Then we went on from that to talk about radical focus. And we looked at if we don't have a radical focus on the word of God, we are never gonna fully experience all that God has for us because the rhema, the written word, and the logos, the living word, cannot be separated. So when we talk about Jesus Christ, the living word of God incarnate, we realize that the written word and the living word cannot be separated, that we cannot live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then last week, we talked about this radical strategy for life. And the radical strategy being that God has a specific purpose and a strategy for us to live by. And we talked last week about everything in life has some measure of strategy, from chess to sports to anything, a strategy, another word, plan, game plan, all those things. But today, today we're looking at this radical vision for mission. Now, I want you to think about this because some of you, I'm sure, have been at a point in your life where you said, I need to have some kind of vision for my life. I need to come up with a personal mission statement for my life. Maybe you're in the business field or the the education field or whatever field you're in. I want to submit to you that there is most definitely in your life some vision driving the mission of your life. At the very basic level, the desire for food and bed and electricity is something that will motivate you for mission in your life. We all like to do things, but Jesus comes along and says, I have got a vision for you that will give you a mission for life that you will never get over. That's why it's called radical vision for mission. Now think about this. The very word radical, I've said it now the past few weeks, it says this about the word. It's favoring, supporting, representing, and or aligning with the extreme. That's what Jesus was all about. When you study the life of Jesus and you see how he interacted with the religious leaders of his day, he was ticking them off left and right, wasn't he? I mean, the religious leaders were like, when they fold their hands, I could almost see it sometimes in scripture. It's almost as clear as watching it on TV or the big screen or whatever. He was definitely a radical and he favoring, supporting, representing and or aligning with the extreme. But today we're looking at vision, a noun that says this, the act or power of anticipating that which will or may come, excuse me, to be an extraordinary scene, sight, or person to behold. Now think about this for a moment. Married men in the room, are there any? Let me hear you. Oh my goodness gracious. 
All right, guys, I'm gonna bail you out here. <clears throat> Men in the room that have a significant lady by them that may not be married yet, but can I, can I get a <clears throat> from you? All right, yeah, I like the way you did that. Much, much better. When you first saw her, the vision, right? And all of a sudden, a mission came into your life. How am I gonna get that lady to talk to me, right? So we have a vision and some mission. I'll never forget when I first laid eyes on my, well, she wasn't my wife then, obviously. She was, she was interested. But now my wife, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what is the mission to get her attention so I can behold that vision a little bit longer? Are you with me? That's what Jesus is giving us when we have the vision that drives the mission of my life and your life. Mission is a noun, and it means this. Any important task or duty that is assigned, allotted, or self-imposed, an important goal or purpose that is accompanied by strong conviction, a calling, or vocation. So let me ask a question. What is the vision for your life, and what is the mission that that vision is driving. If you don't know it just like that, this message is for you. And I wanna tell you once this message is done, you're gonna have a very clear vision and you will have to answer and decide if you will implement and pursue and go for the mission that God is calling you to. I wanna share just a few scriptures to further lay the foundation for what I just said to you. Think about Luke 2, 49. Jesus says this, some of the red letters that you see. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? This was a young Jesus that had stayed behind when his parents took off. And if you recall the story in scripture, after a few days, the parents finally realized they left Jesus back at the temple. Now, they didn't have the, the milk cartons with missing back then. <clears throat> they go back and then Jesus says those words, not, hey, gee, I'm sorry I didn't listen. I'm sorry I didn't stay around with you. He says those words, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? In other words, I had to be about my father's business. Vision, mission. John 5, 17. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work even to this very day, and I too am working. So the picture that Jesus is giving us, the vision that Jesus is giving us, is that his father is always at work, all around us, and Jesus is at work too. So when you go through your life, do you look for the opportunities where God is at work? Because the scripture says God is always at work. It's not like God just takes a day off and says, well, I'm just gonna go fishing for the day. Because every day God is fishing for someone, somebody. Can I get an amen? Every day. The question is, is his children, are his children looking for where he's at work? When I was growing up, I didn't have much of a choice to figure out if my dad was working around the house. Because my dad, once a Marine, always a Marine, would make sure you knew if he was working around the house. Early morning on Saturday and Friday night lights with the football games and you're dead tired and feeling beat up. At 6.30 or 7 in the morning, you'd hear <coughs> outside the walls of the house to let you know he was working. And if my father was working around the house, Guess who else was working around the house? Yours truly was working around the house. But here's the difference, and I'm being honest. When I was that age, it wasn't very exciting for me to say, oh man, I get to go out and help my father. Woo, Lord, it wasn't that, I mean, that was the way it was. But for us, once we have the vision that God has for us, the mission is, I'm looking, I'm looking, I see God working over there. I'm gonna go and join that. And here's the interesting thing. When you see the vision, 
the mission that you have may be a little bit different from the mission I have as it relates to the vision I see. And that's what today is about. That's why I am so stinking excited about this, this message because it connects all the dots back to the verse we launched with when we thought about Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And this is where so many churches miss it. Ephesians 2, 8 says this, for it is by grace you have been saved. Grace, the, the delivery agent, <clears throat> the conduit. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And here it is, catch this. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So here's the thing. When my wife is getting ready in the morning, it's funny, I don't know if you all have this, it, it, you know, we have our master bathroom, but we're still dodging around each other getting ready. And I said, honey, are you working on that masterpiece for God right now? She says, oh yeah, you know it. And she's doing her stuff, right? And I'm sitting back thinking, you know, that's really what we have to be about. We have to realize that you and I, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, if we have beheld the vision that is Jesus, we realize that we are the literal word in the Greek there, his handiwork is his masterpiece. Can I ask you something right now? Here's the question for you. What is your masterpiece? What, what's your masterpiece? When, when you and I breathe our last breath, what will the masterpiece that we have be? Because I can tell you from God's perspective right now based on that scripture, he has many masterpieces, and guess what? Next time you look in the mirror, you are looking at one of God's masterpieces. You are looking, if you are his, at one of God's masterpieces. Now, once you realize that, which I've just shown you from the scripture, once you understand that you are one of his masterpieces, what are you going to do about it? That's what I had to answer. That's what you've got to answer. And I've asked Michelle Moreno, um, our our youth director, leader, and co-leader for our sex trafficking uh, ministry to come up because here's what's interesting, and just grab the mic, Michelle, if you would. When we look at our own lives, we kind of look and see where God moved, right? So maybe a masterpiece, maybe it was whether you're into painting or pottery or clay, we kind of realize when God takes a big chisel and hits our lives, right? Because it's like, oh man, I felt that. That situation there, that was a major stone coming off of the masterpiece that is my life. I felt that, Lord. But for the most part, we look at our lives and we see our lives and we say, well, that was then. But when you condense things, when you condense things and you look at a time period that is much shorter and you see God's activity on a larger scale and a larger level, you go, oh my gosh, I see the handiwork of God. And so what I asked Michelle to do is just to kind of come up and, and what has it been since you've moved here? How many months? Since last September. Okay. So, so let's see, uh, knot times knot, carry the knot. Uh, like nine months, nine whatever months. it is. Okay. So we, we got that, right? So in nine months, she was down in South Florida rocking it for Jesus, doing her thing, already a Christian, involved in church, family down there, and all of a sudden God says, go. Right? Because it wasn't a high-pitched voice. It was a low-pitched. That low was pitched. exactly how That was exactly the voice exactly she heard. Okay. So tell us what happened from the time you left and you came up here on faith to just follow God's call to serve. Okay, well at first, uh, thank you so much for having me up. This is an amazing opportunity to be up here and share this. Um, it has been a journey, but it's been one of a lifetime. Uh, like Pastor Rick said, it was kind of uh, something God just said, go, and I was like, go where? I'm already here, I'm home, my friends are here, my family's here, and I'm comfortable. But God sometimes tells us to go and be uncomfortable because that's what he wants. He has something better for us. So I said, okay, Lord. And something that I always love in the Bible is the story of the first disciples when Jesus said, follow me. And they dropped it immediately without hesitation. They left their family and they knew that God had called them to something higher. So I prayed and I said, Lord, I'm just going to pack my bags. I'm just going to drive to Eustis and 
take over and see what, what goes on. So from there, I left. I did leave my family. My close, intimate family is back in South Florida. I have some in Miami and some in Broward. Uh, some of them were not very happy with me leaving, but they were sad, and, but they were like, you know, you're doing what God calls you. So I just went in faith. I said, Lord, it's you and I. You and me, let's do this thing. And so I went. I didn't have a job. I didn't really, like, I did have a good plan here, but Pastor Rick and his family took me in and really just allowed me to start the ministry with the youth and with Lauren with human trafficking. And from then on, it has been a growing process. You know, it's been one that hasn't always been easy because there's been times where I have missed home. But I will tell you that one thing that the Lord whispered to me back then, um, I, was in a, I was in like a park and I was just with him and I, and he just said, do you trust me? Just, do you trust me? And I said, Lord, I do trust you. He's like, okay, so get ready for the journey of your life right now. And so from then on, I had no idea what was going to happen. I didn't know that I was going to meet some of the most amazing people, some people that have known me, like fully known me and fully loved me and accepted me. And from then on, uh, I had a situation with my car. Uh, some of you know, like something just happened, but God provided. And again, do you trust me? That question came out again. Yeah, we can give that. Yeah. <laughs> And again, he provided, and I was in a great job uh, for the last couple of months of being able to serve and be a light to others in the community, but I was like, God, I want more. Like, I know that there's something else, but he's like, be patient. You know how God calls us to be patient. He's like, just wait, just hold on a second. And so I kept praying, kept praying, and I was like, Lord, and just seeking him and just being in the community with the youth and human trafficking and meeting all these amazing people and organizations, just being involved and just really being willing, because sometimes God... He just wants our heart, and he wants us to say, God, I'm here, and he will take that and take you on a journey. So recently, I've had the privilege to have a job working in the ministry for an organization called His Missions, which is an organization that has to do with human trafficking, fighting human trafficking, and also helping kids with needs. And it's been, I'm smiling because it's my dream job, and it happened in a way that I was like, hey, this is, I've been praying about a job, and do you know anybody? He's like, well, actually, we're hiring. And, we, and it was like a three-week process, and, you know, now I start this week. And so it's amazing, but I will say I have met some of the most amazing people. And, sorry. It's just amazing because God, you know, he took me from being broken, and he just wanted my heart. And as soon as I said, God, I'm here, this is me. He took me and just shifted me around and has really helped me be the leader that I am today. And it's still a struggle, you know. I'm still growing, and I will continue to grow and, until I reach heaven. But I will say, if God is putting something on your heart to just be willing, please do it. Mm. Because you want, I would, this decision is probably the best decision I ever made besides accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Because I have met the most amazing people. I have grown the most. And it's just been a oh, whirlwind. Boom. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so catch this if you're taking notes. The blessing followed the obedience. Blessing followed the obedience. She was down in South Florida living for Jesus, doing her thing there. God says, I want you to move. Are you sure, God? Is this, is this the pizza from last night? Too much talking? I don't know, God. Uh, okay, yes. She moves here. She lands a job, first interview, she, in a medical field which was similar to her education, her, her degree from college. Similar. But it wasn't necessarily her passion. She moved up here to work with young people and human trafficking. She gets here, her car is totaled practically. God provides another car. She then is thinking, I, I, I love my job that I'm at, but God, I think you're doing something else. Then through the process of networking and just doing church and doing life, this guy that deals with children's ministry, youth ministry, and human trafficking says, would you like to join our team? People, if you don't see how God works, it's amazing how God works. The blessing of obedience is something that if you haven't learned, today is the day to write it down, put it somewhere, and say the blessing of obedience is real. Success of any kind, success of, I don't know, however you want it, this isn't a success message, but however you want to measure success, teacher, lawyer, doctor, 
home, house parent, home, but whatever it is, however you measure success, success requires a vision and mission to work that vision out. It's just the way that it is. You can either go through the Christian life, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, as a passive observer or an active participant. And I'm here to tell you, the passive observer is not biblical. It's not biblical. Nowhere in scripture do you say Jesus, see Jesus saying, come on, give me a try, get on the team, just be a passive observer. That is the antithesis of radical. Jesus said, come and follow me, Peter, who was a fisherman, and I will make you fishers of men. To Matthew, the tax collector, he may have said something like, Matthew, come and follow me, and I'll tell you how to count people that are joining the family of God. You see how he relates? He gives you the vision and then helps you flesh out the mission. So what I want to do is allow you to see how Jesus Y'all need to say something when my mic starts going. I'm up here talking away and I'm like, one of those things. Seeing Jesus as your vision and owning your mission. Owning your mission. Your mission isn't my mission. Now we may have a broader picture vision, say of coming together to make Hope City Church, uh, a church that loves God, loves people and brings hope to this city. That's where y'all say amen. Um, amen, right, good. I'm just queuing y'all up. I know it's early for some of you. But anyway, once you see that, then it gets much more specific as God fleshes that mission out. But seeing Jesus as your vision and owning your mission. Listen to Isaiah 61. Just the few, first two verses. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is so good right here. Because when you see this verse in Isaiah, you see that it's 700 plus years before it would be said in Luke, who also wrote Acts, in Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said the very same thing. It was fulfilled prophecy. 700 plus years before the Messiah came and said those very words that he was coming to allow captivity to be set free. Now here's the key. When you see Jesus as your vision, that changes everything. Because when you have the right vision for life, your mission will become the right mission for your life. Many people go through life thinking, oh man, my life isn't mattering. It doesn't, it just doesn't making a difference. Can I just tell you that maybe you're just a couple degrees out of alignment. Once you get the mission right, catch this too, as, you, as I read those two verses from Isaiah. Did you see where it said the sovereign, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the, uh, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. This is our vision. Jesus, he came to proclaim good news to the poor. He's not talking about monetary. He's talking about those that are just downtrodden, beaten down by life, poor in spirit. So your vision will define your mission. Here's the thing. Do you have this Jesus, and are you sharing this Jesus? Because if you have Jesus, you have to be able to share him somehow. You may only share him with one person. Remember I asked you a little bit ago, what's your masterpiece? If you're a parent, can I tell you, it's not necessarily the job you go to from nine or eight to five or whatever it is. Your greatest masterpiece, if you're a parent, is probably going to be your family. I mean, who's going to be at your funeral when you breathe your last breath? Is it going to be every person you've ever worked with? Maybe. But I can guarantee you one thing, your family's going to be there. What's the masterpiece going to be? The master working through you is what brings you peace, not P-I-E, but P-E-A, peace. So if you're going to share Jesus, you first of all have to have received him and know him and see him 
But then you have to realize that that is the power that is to be shared in the people's lives that are poor and downtrodden and brokenhearted that need something. The second part of that Isaiah 61 says that he was sent to bind up the brokenhearted. There is so much power in that if you catch that verse right there. Because so many people around us have been brokenhearted or are still brokenhearted. And I've got great news for you if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ. If you have been brokenhearted, God allowed you to go through that season in your life so that you might help others that are brokenhearted. So see, here's the reality and here's the vision that we have for the mission of our life. When we begin to see that he is our vision, the mission becomes clear. We have Jesus, we are to share him and we are to look for the opportunities to do what he did to help bind up those that have been brokenhearted in the same way that we have been brokenhearted. Maybe it was a relationship that went south or further than south and we were brokenhearted. Maybe it was a business venture. We had everything in and it went south. Do you think God wastes any opportunities? I mean, he is a master strategist. He is a master five-dimensional chess player. He doesn't waste any opportunities. The question is, do we see the opportunities or are we so self-absorbed about our own lives that we miss what's going on around us? with people at our school, with people at our work, wherever it may be. You may be a middle schooler or a high schooler and you're going through life thinking, well, I'm not really feeling it. Hey, stop trying to feel it and make sure it's felt by other people. I think of our middle school age people that are a part of Hope City. Can you imagine if you were to rally together and say, we are gonna be a massive agent of change force for our school and we're gonna look to share Jesus when we see people that look brokenhearted, we're gonna say, look, I've got someone that'll heal your brokenheartedness. It's Jesus Christ. He's got everything you need. And all of a sudden, those people that may not have seemed very lovable are receiving love from people that profess to have love through Jesus Christ. And they say, man, this Jesus must be real because you saw him as your vision and all of a sudden now your mission has changed to where you're looking at things through different lenses and they are the S-O-N glasses. So we begin to see and share Jesus. We begin to heal the brokenhearted because we realize that where our heart has been broken, others have been too. But then it comes to say that he has come to set captivity free. I love that passage. I always wanted to be the guy that saw people locked up and in bondage that should not be there because I've been in bondage at times in my life. You've been in bondage at times in your life. How do I know that? Because that's life, baby, as they say. That's life. We all go from one thing to another and that's what the enemy tries to do is lock us down into keeping us tied down and ineffective to where there's bondage in our lives. It may see some form of addiction, drugs, alcohol, sexual, whatever it may be, but when God sets us free from that and we are free indeed, we need to be able to look at other people that may be struggling or in bondage and say, I've got the key to unlock it and his name is Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus came to do. That was his vision, his mission. And when we see him as our vision, it becomes our mission too. And then that last part says, we are to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Oh, man. Oh, if you can't get excited about Jesus when you start going through his word and see that he does not have the big holy stick and he's not ready just to whack everybody over the head that's come on, that this is the time of his favor. This is the period where Jesus came, the resurrection happened, Pentecost came, the church is growing and it is still growing to this day. And I know it because you are here. Seeing Jesus as your vision and owning your mission changes so much. We move from being bondage makers that the devil is in our life and seeing bondage in our life to being set free by the bondage breaker that is Jesus Christ. But realizing the earthly and eternal consequence of not seeing that vision and mission is absolutely huge. It is. The consequences of not seeing Jesus as your vision and the mission that comes along with that is huge. Let me give you the eternal scope and then I'll break it down. The eternal scope is heaven or hell. Now there there are some doctrines out there in theologies where some churches are trying to steer away from even mentioning the word hell 
And I don't know how you do that because if you say we don't wanna talk about hell, then you might as well not talk about the cross. And if you're not gonna talk about the cross, you're not gonna talk about sin. And if you're not gonna talk about sin, you're not gonna talk about redemption. And if you're not gonna talk about redemption, you're not gonna talk about the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross of Calvary. It's just that simple. So you have to be able to break it all down. And when you start seeing that there are consequences that are not just earthly, but eternal. Oh man, when I see our students, I love seeing our children and students because they're at an age where they can rock this community for Christ. And I get fired up because I see them in the schools and they can be in the middle schools, the high schools, elementary schools, whatever school you want to be in. And they could start talking to their friends and the schools and the officials can't do nothing about it. Nothing. And I'm sitting back to our young people and I'm saying, Ooh, go because they get the opportunity to do something that us grownups can't do. Oh man, I get holy goosebumps when I start thinking about that. Realizing those consequences are not just earthly, but eternal. The eternal is heaven or hell. Every person ever made will live in one of two places for eternity, heaven or hell. Jesus is the answer for heaven. But there are earthly consequences too. Proverbs 29, 18, a little different translation. The New American Standard says this, where there is no vision, the people perish or are unrestrained, but happy is one who keeps the law. So in other words, that that passage that I, I memorized years ago, where there is no vision, the people perish, it, 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 a lot of levels, but let me start from the bottom and then work it, work it up to the top. If you go through life without a healthy vision, there isn't gonna be mission in your life, there isn't gonna be purpose in your life, and you're gonna go through life thinking, Man, my life really stinks. But when you elevate that to where your vision is the vision of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, the mission of your life, the reason for your life, the purpose of your life becomes unchained. And you have a radical vision for mission in life. So the point is, when people see Jesus as their vision, In other words, let me substitute the word vision with Jesus. See how it reads. Where there is no Jesus, the people perish. Mm. That there they will say in seminary, that there will preach. That's a pop-up top of preach because where there is no Jesus, the people perish, whether it's the afterlife or this here life without Jesus, people are perishing and we have to see that. We have to see it. There's, it's, there's too many could have, should have, would have going on in church life 101. That's why we read in John 3, 16 and 18, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believes in him. Oh, wait, there's more? Oh, let me finish that. I, I guess I missed the rest of it. That whomsoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So you mean to tell me that that word perish is there for a reason. I took you right back to Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no Jesus, the people perish. Verse 17 of John 3. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Hollow religion, hollow empty services will never be able to change a person's life. Only Jesus. And once we see that vision and it is fleshed out in our life, it changes everything. The last point I have is this, personalizing God's vision and his mission for your life. See, we can talk about the vision and the mission and we can talk about the earthly and eternal consequences, but if we don't personalize it, it doesn't really get to where it needs to get in our lives. Amen? We have to personalize it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you even to the very end of the age. Did you all capture a key word in there, that word A-L-L? Do you know what the word in the, in the original Greek language all means? All. <clears throat> so when we're sitting back <clears throat> excuse me, in life and we're thinking, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I should try that. I don't know if I should do that. <clears throat> I'm down South Florida and I'm thinking, wait, I think God's calling me to move up to the Mount Dora Eustace area, but I don't know. I, I sense it, but I just don't know. Let me ask you this. If God is God, and he is, and he controls and sustains everything in the universe, which he does, and you sense that he's calling you to do something, is God a big enough God that if he sees you in your life responding to him in faith and saying, God, I, I believe, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've sought counsel, you're calling me to do this, and you do this, you step out of the boat, that he's gonna go, oh, I'm gonna watch you sink. All means all. I know the devil is the prince of the power of the air. All you have to do is watch the news to figure that out. I know that he is the God little g of this world. All you have to do is see what this world goes after. But all authority belongs to Jesus. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. All authority belongs to him. When we look at the book of Acts, the first 12 chapters really deal with the beginnings of the church. Getting, it, getting all everything together, getting it set up. But the, the last part of it, chapters 13 to 28, deals with the expansion of the church. I want you to see something important. Acts 13, four verses as I wrap this up. Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius the, of Cyrene and Manian, and Saul, verse two, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. So Michelle or anyone, next time you think God is saying, do this, and you've prayed about it, you've fasted, you've sought counsel, and you say, God's calling me to do this. You don't ever have to doubt. We don't ever have to doubt because all authority is God's. And when he says something where God calls, God provides, amen? That's the reality of scripture. That's the reality of our God. You say, I don't know. I've got this, I've got that. Everybody here and everybody watching can pray. No limitations on that. Everyone here, everyone watching can help send. You may have health issues. You may have other physical reasons. You can't actually go, but you may be able to get behind someone that says, I'm going to do this, but I need someone to help me go. Everyone can pray. Everyone can help send. And I want to tell you, once you understand the power of go, a lot of us can go. It may not have to be across the globe. It may not have to be across the country. It may be in an aisle at the grocery store. We have to realize our vision, Jesus, is our mission. When someone finally meets Christ, when you and I and those watching online, when we finally meet Christ, let me, let me even expand that. When all people meet Christ, it's just a matter of when. Matter of when. The scripture says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess Jesus is Lord. Every means every. There are two critical phrases, I believe, and they may not be worded exactly like this, but it's scriptural. Two critical phases that two different people groups will hear. One is, and then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you, depart from me. I never knew you, depart from me. In the context, you can look at that scripture and see what it's saying. It's talking about eternal judgment 
and the penalty of refusing Christ. Be cast off from me and thrown into hell with the devil and his demons. But there's another statement, another phrase, and this is the one I look forward to, that says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your eternal reward. Every time I get ready to preach, every time I get ready to do something that I sense God is calling me to, it may not be easy, it may be difficult, it may take time, it may take energy that sometimes I don't have. But guess what? I think of the phrase when I meet my Jesus face to face and he says, Rick, high five. And he does that thing where he puts his hand up so high, I'm like trying to jump and hit it. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. Listen to that statement. Hear this, it doesn't say, Rick, you were perfect at what you did. Everything you did was flawless. Not with me. You've been around me long enough, you know that ain't true. Says, my good and faithful servant. Oh, man. It almost makes me cry when you think about the goodness of God to call us to join him in his work and we see the vision that is Jesus Christ, and it drives the mission for our lives. <laughs> I'll close with this. It reminds me, and I get all weird, but we have a couple of goddaughters, and one of them, the youngest one, Gabby, is, I don't know what, honey, a year and a half, almost closing in on two years, and uh, she loves her Wick and Gigi, and what's so funny about her is she's just a helper, I mean, she, she's got the walking thing down. She's still kind of running and trying to figure out the running thing, right? But when my wife changes her diaper, wet diaper, wet diaper, she gives it to Gabby and says, you, you throw it out? And I'm sitting maybe over doing some work at a table and she'll run over to the garbage can and push it, drop it in and then turn around and look at me and start clapping her hands. Or she'll pick up something that maybe was on the floor that was trash. And she goes over the garbage and puts it in the garbage and she turns around and she looks at me and she starts clapping. And you know what I do when I see her? I start clapping for her. I say, Gabby, way to go. My friend, that's what Jesus does for you. If you are a follower of his and he is your vision and you're fleshing out the mission, he is applauding you. He is your biggest cheerleader. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word, which is truth. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that comes to ignite the truth and magnify it in our lives. Father, I pray that right now, through the power of your word and your spirit, you would set captivity free, that you would heal the brokenhearted, that you would allow each and every person hearing this message right now to know this is the year of the Lord's favor. God, for those of us that call you Father, you're cheering us on. You're saying, come on, come on. But there may be some here today, God, that they've never humbled themselves before you. And if that is you and you're hearing my voice, I invite you to pray this prayer of decision, just saying, God, come into my life. You can pray it silently as I pray it out loud. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. I confess my sins to you, the things that have separated us, and I invite you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior, and I give you the rest of my days. Father, for others in the room right now, maybe they've never really fully seen the power of radical vision for mission. Maybe they're wrestling with the meaning of their life, the purpose of their life. Until we get the vision right, the mission will not be right. And so for others right now, God, we need to say, God, you are now our vision. Allow us to see clearly that we are to be on mission with you. In Jesus' name, amen.